uh, I will be brief on what I have to say on uh, uh, what's the current status with LNG. So LNG comes to life, more than 400 ships right now being ordered or in service, a number of uh, uh, vessels ready and uh, a, a comprehensive bunkering supply chain already in place or being in place at the time of new deliveries. So I will come up with this map, global map of bunkering locations around the world. You can see cubic capacities will can cater, which can cater with uh, large ships, container ships, uh, VLCCs, Aframax tankers around the world. You can also see here the, the phenomenon, the effect of the European Union, where the ECA zone, in conjunction with uh, uh, the, the funding mechanisms of Europe, make the difference in Northern Europe. But we also have Singapore, we have Durban, we have China, Japan, the US now moving into the LNG banking supply chain as well. So we can cover all the major trade routes. So the outlook right now, the, the, the main positive point comes from uh, uh, the, the fundamentals of LNG as a commodity. So we expect this to be in abundant supply over the years to come, and this will push pricing down. So this will remain competitive in pricing. And of course, bunkering will not be able to impact this market, but it will be in a, in a position to benefit from this market. And we expect, and I will use a forecast here, we expect the LNG bunkering market to grow at a substantial annual growth rate of 50 to 60%. I will focus now on this slide, which I think is one of the most important. So right now, we, we had the discussion, we're gonna have a lot of discussion about decarbonization, 2050, we don't know yet the answer. What we need to know today is the current status. And the current status is, on one hand, the IMO short-term measures that are going to bother us in the next decade. And the other part is the EU MRV emissions trade, so-called emissions trade scheme, the amendment of the MRV directive. And I will focus a bit there because we don't have the chance to discuss this. This is a draft. This is not final yet, so it may be changed. We, some, some of us may hope that this will change. And uh, so it refers to 40% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emission by 2030 on the basis of the first operating period of the MRV. It makes reference to meat and sleep explicitly so methane slip will be translated to an equivalent to carbon dioxide and will get into this. And eventually there will be a fund that will be funded, supported by this mechanism. And the carbon allowance money from shipping will end up to that fund supporting the transition. So what's important here is that by 2030, we need to comply with targets that are on the verge of what we can deliver today. The different, what can make the difference for the time being and the only available mature solution right now, as things stand, seem to be LNG. So there may be reasons why someone should perhaps go down the LNG option for the next decade, but what will happen until 2050? Uh, that's, these are only indications. There's a lot of uncertainty about the technology that will be around by that time. But I will just brief, I will be brief on four options that we have today for an LNG fuel ship tomorrow. So the four options are biomethane, synthetic methane, carbon capture, and shifting to a zero carbon fuel. So starting at the end, zero carbon fuels, what we hear about today, it's unfair to compare LNG with them because they are not as mature, but the main problems or uh, characteristics we see today with ammonia, compatibility, IGC relevant require, uh, requirements, uh, the corrosivity of ammonia, the nitrogen oxides produced, which, which can be tackled by available technology, however, cubic capacity, 40% more than LNG, toxicity, 
more risk analysis needed there because this will lead to fatalities if we have an incident. On the other hand, hydrogen, liquefaction and minus 253, incompatible with existing assets as a liquid. Uh, cubic capacity, 2.5 times more than LNG, which means that for the CMA CGM 23,000 TEU vessels, you would need 50,000 cubic meters of liquid hydrogen tank tanks to fuel that vessel. And of course, flammability for hydrogen. So we need to have in mind that both hydrogen and ammonia are currently produced using uh, methane. So we are not there yet as far as sustainable production is concerned. Synthetic methane, I will be brief on that, is uh, a, a huge prospect. Three key technologies are related to this. Electrolysis, sequestration, methanation. The exact condition right now, we have two uh, uh, technologies right now on, on carbon capture. One, the, di the, the, the director capture is quite mature. Uh, the carbon capture, uh, excuse me, from point source is quite mature. The director capture is not yet mature, but we expect this to mature quite uh, swiftly. Methanation is already in place, but it's not uh, competitive in terms of cost yet. Biomethane, I would say you know that down. That's a great prospect for, uh, for biogas, and I will, be, I will have the chance to uh, explain why biogas is uh, more competitive in the, in the sense of potential uh, 2050 option. Carbon capture and storage, what is important here is how do we dispose, what do we make with the bike product? There are a number of research area uh, projects uh, underway. Uh, we need to see what kind of byproduct and how we can get rid of this or store this on board. And of course, I will, uh, I, I, I will focus a bit on that part, the LNG Achilles heel, which is methane slip. So I think it will be critical. It will be uh, uh, of paramount importance to leave that, let me call it noise behind. So we need to put the right uh, technology in place to deal with methane slip as soon as possible. We need to see it on real terms and not on noise terms, excuse the expression, but what we need to, to be aware of is where exactly this, come from, this comes from and how do we apply measures either operational or choose the right engine technology or improve the current engine technology to tackle this. And uh, I, would I, I will make, let's say, this is provided on a sensitivity analysis on a sensitivity basis, so don't take it for granted, but it's, it's part of what we could see in the future. So I will not talk about the LNG savings, but I will talk about uh, the potential methane slip charge. So what you can see, it's a simple calculation. What you can see here is, is a modern ECHO VLCC methane slip daily charge for the main engine use in US dollars per gram uh, per kilowatt hour. So I will not choose what the exact methane slip rate is. You can do the, the calculation. So there are two bases uh, for uh, methane, methane slip and methane potential in greenhouse gas effect. Uh, the 100 years global warming potential scale and the 20 years global warming potential scale. Uh, the one, the 20 years is quite higher than the 100 years. What you can see here is assuming that you have carbon pricing based on an ETS or some kind of other instrument uh, at uh, 100 US dollars per ton of carbon, you could get uh, three and a half thousand US dollars per grammar of methane slip. So, if you have two grammars, we are talking about 7,000 per day, only on methane slip terms. So this is something we need to keep in mind uh, for the years to come. We need to be quite cautious on what kind of technology we select today because we may be charged on it in the years to come. 
So what the future could look like, not on the, uh, excuse me, this is not on the basis of 100% uh, carbon neutral uh, realities. This is based on what, uh, what is more pragmatic in market terms. So uh, flexibility is quite important. We're going to see, we're not going to see ammonia everywhere as we haven't seen uh, uh, all kinds of blends all around the world. We will see geographical differences in uh, availability and pricing of different fuels. So you may have biofuels in other areas available. Then you can have fossil fuels. Uh, what's important about LNG is that it can also deliver uh, a blend of different origin of, uh, gases. So uh, it could be fossil LNG, we could talk about bio LNG, we could talk about synthetic LNG. All these could blend together into one fuel that you will use in accordance with carbon taxation, carbon emission requirements at any given, at any given moment. And that's, that it's quite important to be flexible on that. And eventually, we could shift into a different kind of fuel, which is um, ammonia, for example. However, I will point out that as things stand right now, it's quite early to say how this is going to happen. And we see a number of issues in turning a gas fuel ship into a, an ammonia fuel ship. So uh, we can't take it for granted that uh, this will happen. And we need to make sure that uh, what uh, the result, the, 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 the options ahead will be. So closing, uh, the main conclusion is that we, we see now that LNG is, uh, f uh, has, has seen the favor of the financials needed. There are a number of, of uncertainties on decarbonization, but there are a number of prospects as well. Uh, methane slips in the short term, biogas in the midterm, and carbon capture in the longer term are the areas where we could focus our research effort. And irrespective of whether you're pro-LNG or not, you should consider uh, we feel an LNG favorable scenario in the future. So it could happen that irrespective of what the discussion about decarbonization, decarbonization is, within the next decade, LNG may become quite competitive in terms of pricing, given the whole context of carbon taxation as well. So LNG may be a more competitive fuel in the years to come, and you should at least consider that prospect or risk depending on where you stand. So thank you very much for your attention.